For a long time, the world refused to look upon Mormons as Christians. Indeed, most people still think of them as a tertium quid, unique and isolated from all other creatures. There is some justice in this viewpoint if one defines a Christian as one who subscribes to the creeds of Christendom. But the dictionary gives no such definition. For it, a Christian is simply one who believes in Christ, with nothing said about adherence to formulae devised to describe his nature 300 years after his death. The Latter-day Saints do not accept the ecumenical creeds because they were not given by the power of revelation, but worked out by committees of experts. As we noted last week, the early church could not make too much of the inability of philosophers to discover the nature of God. Yet the first and greatest of the councils, that of Nicaea, may without exaggerated, uh, exaggeration be described as a philosopher's field day. Let us consider briefly a few steps that led to the formation of the creed. It all began, we're following Socrates' church history now, when Bishop Alexander of Alexandria, quote, one day in a meeting of his presbyters and the rest of the clergy under him, theologized in a rather showy way, Philotimoteran, on the subject of the Holy Trinity, philosophizing to the effect that in a triad was really a monad, technical word, you see. Arius, one of the presbyters under his authority and a man not unskilled in dialectic give and take, took the extreme opposite position just to show how much smarter he was out of Philonikias, we're told, and in reply, biting, and replied bitingly to the things the bishop had said. Socrates concludes a summary of Arius' speech on this occasion by saying, quote, constructing his syllogisms by this novel reasoning, he attracted everybody's attention and with a small spark lit a mighty blaze, unquote. Now, isn't this a perfect illustration of those very vices and follies for which the original Christians condemned philosophy? The bishop philosophizing in a showy way, not seeking truth, but just being smart, using technical terms, triad and monad, unknown to the scripture, is refuted by a clergyman, carefully trained, we are told, in that dialectic art which the early fathers so abhorred. He too animated not by love of truth, but by a desire to outshine the bishop. Such is the spirit in which the great investigation begins. The mighty blaze mentioned by Socrates divided the Christian world into warring factions, and the Emperor Constantine wrote a strong letter to the heads of both parties. In this letter he says, among other things, quote, these and such like technical questions are simply a sort of parlor game, Ereskalia, for the passing of idle time. And albeit they may be justified as providing a kind of training for the wits, they are best left kept locked and confined in your own minds and not lightly aired in public places nor foolishly permitted to reach the ears of the masses. For just how many people are there, Constantine asks, who can understand such advanced and extremely puzzling matters? or have any clear idea what they are about, or give a correct explanation of them. And even if someone should suppose that he could understand it easily, how many of the common people will he be able to persuade? <clears throat> or who would be able to carry on a disputation in the subtleties of such technical questions without running an appalling risk? Therefore, a great outpouring of words in such matters should be prohibited, lest the problem presently carry us beyond the depths of our own limited understanding, or we go beyond the limited training of those who listen to our teachings, who can no longer understand what is said, and out of this double defect that is ours and theirs, the whole society necessarily fall into blasphemy or schism. While you wrangle with one another over minor, nay, utterly trivial matters, it is not right that God's numerous people should be led by your minds. In view of your disunity, such a thing is utterly wrong, says the emperor, absolutely improper. What a lecture to the leaders of the church. And these were the men who were to make the creeds. In the end, the emperor had to summon, as we all know, the great council of Nicaea. While, gathering the, while the gathering body of the churchmen was waiting for the latecomers to arrive, some interesting preliminary discussions were held. These illustrate perfectly the spirit of the whole thing. We are told that a large number of laymen were there, experts in the art of dialectic, that is philosophy, entering enthusiastically into the discussions on every side. Meanwhile, now we're quoting Socrates again, not long before the general assembly was to take place, certain dialecticians were addressing the multitude and showing off in controversy. Great crowds being attracted by the pleasure of hearing them, one of the confessors, a layman with a clear head, stood up and rebuked the dialecticians and said to them that Christ and the apostles didn't give, us, give to us the dialectic art nor empty tricks, but straightforward knowledge preserved by faith and good works. When he said this, all those who were, pleasant, uh, were present were flabbergasted. 
and then agreed, and the dialecticians, hearing straight talk, became a good deal more sober and contained. Thus was abated the uproar which dialectic had stirred up. End of quote. There were still clear heads in the church, but they did not belong to the men who were about to make the creeds. They are represented here by an aged layman. He's called aged in other sources. A martyr, that is, one who had refused to deny the faith in persecution, a link with the real old church, who here appears among the squabbling doctors as a nine days wonder when he reminds them how far from the track of Christ and the apostles they have come. They were abashed for the time, uh, but not repentant. Let us skip to the closing speech of the mightiest of councils. It was delivered fittingly by the emperor, who was first to bear witness, as quoting Eusebius in a letter written to his constituents, to the correctness of the creed, and he urged everyone to come to the same opinion and sign the statement of doctrines and to agree with each other by signing a statement to which but a single term had been added, the word homoousian. The emperor then proceeded to explain the word, which had been agreed on in committee, with much technical language and the final verdict that the thing was really incomprehensible. So in such a manner, Eusebius concludes, our most wise and devout emperor philosophized, and he uses the word philosophized, and the bishops, by way of explaining the homoousius, prepared the following statement. In the statement that follows occurs an interesting admission. The bishops say, quote, We are well aware that the bishops and writers of ancient times, when discussing the theology of the Father and the Son, never used the word homoousius. <clears throat> to allay all doubts of his flock, Eusebius hastens to assure them, that the faith here promulgated, we all agreed on, not without careful examination, and according to opinions presented and agreed upon in carefully stated logismoi, and in the presence of the most devout emperor. In other words, the committee had worked hard. All the trouble has been caused, according to this document, quote, by the use of certain expressions not found in the scripture, since the divinely inspired scriptures never use such terms as out of nothing, or that existed which at one time did not exist, and such like terms. For it did not seem proper, El Logan, to say such things and teach such things. Never in times before have we thought it proper to use these terms. The letter then proceeds to authorize the use of those very terms which it recognizes were unknown to the early Christians. Had God changed his nature that he needed new terms to describe it? We left the word logismoi untranslated above because Paul uses the very same word in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 when he says that revealed knowledge, the gnosis, invalidates or confounds all logismoi, that is, all calculations of men. Now Eusebius takes comfort in the thought that the Nicene Creed is made up of carefully worded logismoi. You see how the foundations of doctrine had shifted from prophetic revelation to human reason. Latter-day Saints would regard such a change as fatal to the church, and in this they are in good company. For though conventional church histories pass it over in complete silence, the fact is that the early ecumenical councils of the church were viewed by the leading churchmen of the time and by the general public alike as a most grave and alarming symptom. Let some of these men explain it in their own words. We'll quote from Athanasius and Hilary here. Athanasius, one of the star performers at Nicaea, viewed with alarm the councils that immediately followed that one, and now we'll just quote him. What is left to the Catholic Church to teach of salvation if now they make investigations into the faith and set up a present-day authority to give out official interpretations of what has already been said? And why do the so-called clergy dash back and forth trying to find out how they should believe about our Lord Jesus Christ? If they had been believing all along, they couldn't possibly be searching now for something they don't have. End of quote. He says, everyone is laughing at the Christian leaders and saying, these Christians don't know what to think of Christ, which, of course, weakens their authority. What is the use of all these synods, he asks? In vain do they dash hither and yon under the pretext that the synods are necessary to settle important matters of doctrine, for the Holy Scripture are sufficient for all that. We contradict those who were before us, he says. This is Athanasius still. Depart from the traditions of our fathers and think we must hold a synod. Then we are seized by misgivings, lest if we simply come together and agree, our diligence will be wasted. So we decide that the synod ought to be divided into two groups so we can vote. And so we get the emperor's support and nullify the acts of Nicaea, which we are pretending to be clarifying and simplifying. End of quote. Could anyone ask for a better description of the strangely modern state of mind in which the early creeds of Christendom were hammered out? The zeal of the busy, self-important committeemen, the fussy, fuzzy preoccupation with procedure and busy work, the urge to hold meetings, come what may. All these synods are unnecessary, Athanasius repeats, and they are unnecessary because we have the scripture. 
And if the scripture is a subject of disagreement in the synods, then we have the writings of the fathers. The men at Nicaea were not unmindful of this. As for these other synods, they simply don't make sense, and they never get anywhere. And again he says, Who can call such people Christians? Or how can we speak of faith among men who have neither reason nor writings that aren't changing all the time, but to suit every circumstance are being everlastingly altered and reversed? That's the end of the quote from Athanasius. There are many others, but we hurry on to Hillary now. Hillary says in a famous passage, a letter to Constantius, It is a thing equally deplorable and dangerous that there are as many creeds as opinions among men. Remember, he, this man was present at Nicaea, as was Athanasius. As many doctrines as inclinations, and as many sources of blasphemy as there are faults among us, because we make creeds arbitrarily, and we explain them arbitrarily. The homoousian is rejected and received and explained away by successive synods. Every year, nay, every month, we make new creeds to describe invisible mysteries. Then we repent of what we have done. We defend those who change their minds. We anathemize those whom we defended. We condemn either the doctrine of others in ourselves or our own in that of others. And reciprocally tearing one another to pieces, we have been the cause of each other's ruin. And again to the emperor, he says, the faith has been corrupted. Is re reformation impossible? The faith is sought after as if it were something not in our possession. The faith has to be written down. Those are the written creeds, you see. As if it were not in our hearts. Having been reborn by faith, we are now being taught the faith just as if our rebirth had been without faith. We learn about Christ after we've been baptized, as if there could be any baptism at all without a knowledge of Christ. Unquote. Here the synods and the creeds are depicted as a declaration of bankruptcy, a clear indication that the faith is lost, a frantic attempt to fill a vacuum. And the filling was to be done with words, the endless talk of the philosophers. Speaking of an episode of the council, the historian Sodzeman wrote this in Nicaea. It would be hard to say which is the more miraculous, to make a stone speak or to make a philosopher stop speaking. But let's hear Hillary. Since the whole argument is about words, he says, and since the whole controversy has to do with the subject of innovation, that is the introduction of philosophical terms not found in the scripture, and since the occasion of the discussion is the presence of certain ambiguities, and since the dispute is about authority, and since we are quarreling about technical questions, and since our problem is to reach a consensus, and since each side is beginning to be anathema to the other, it would seem that hardly anyone belongs to Christ or is on Christ's side anymore. We are blown about by winds of doctrine, and as we teach, we only become more upset, and the more we are taught, the more we go astray. End of quote. What a commentary on the councils. We avoid believing that of Christ which he told us to believe, says Hillary, so that we might establish a treacherous unity in the false name of peace. See, they compromise. And we rebel with new definitions of God against what we falsely call innovations. And in the name of the scripture, we deceitfully cite things which are not in the scripture. Changeful, prodigal, impious, changing established things, abolishing accepted doctrine, presuming irreligious things. These end of quote. That's Hillary writing in the fourth century that is not our authority. Here, Hillary is not denouncing heretics as separatists. He is like Athanasius, Eusebius, Basil, Chrysostom, Macacius, Seleucius, Fabadius, a host of lesser lights, depicting not the folly of the few, but as he puts it, the faith of our miserable age. Last year's faith, he asks, what is the changeful stuff that it contains? First it is silence. First it silenced the homoousian. Then it preached it. Then it excused it. Then it condemned it. And where does this sort of thing lead to? To this, that neither we nor our predecessors were in a position to be sure of preserving any sacred thing intact. He wrote this in banishment, incidentally. When men are left to their own resources without the guidance of living prophets, you see what happens. Even the great tradition will not preserve the true faith, for as Hillary has just noted, men are not able of themselves to preserve that tradition. We've quoted a few statements, by no means all the pertinent ones, of two of the most respected voice in Christendom, men who were present in person at the great councils of the fourth century in which the Christian creeds as we now have them received their definitive form. How these men missed the voice of the prophets. The fact that the church should hold councils at all to decide on basic doctrines centuries after Christ and the apostles are supposed to have given those doctrines to the world greatly disturbs not only them, but as they repeatedly tell us, the general membership of the church as well. The fact that those councils carry on their deliberations after the manner and in the artificial language of the schools of philosophy distresses them even more. Throughout the Middle Ages, the ablest men labored mightily to comprehend and restate in intelligible terms those ever-elusive definitions of God. 
school succeeding school exactly as in the fourth century, the Reformation striving to correct administrative abuses and restate certain moral principles left the basic doctrines untouched. And to this day, the whole Christian world, from the cool recesses of the high church Gothic to the torrid canvas of the revivalist, owes allegiance to the angry and perplexed churchmen of the fourth century. Long centuries have shown and shown exhaustively that man cannot, by searching, find out God. Unless dictated by God himself <clears throat> through revelation, any creed must necessarily be a compromise to establish, as Hillary puts it, a treacherous unity in the false name of peace and that at the price of deliberately sacrificing truth. In the long history of the creeds, time has strikingly vindicated the prophets. If we are to have a creed, the living voice of prophecy alone can prescribe it, and in this the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints stands alone. <laughs>